NFL Daily, where we never like to be reminded of Super Bowl 46, but <laughs> but we are today. I'm here in the Chris Wesley Podcast Studio with my friend, friend Patrick Claybon. And yes, joining us, I believe, from NFL Films, wearing the Super Bowl 46 hat. Appreciate it you, Baldy. Is the man, yeah. Brian Baldinger. How you doing? Greg, Patrick, I'm, I'm doing great. Um, putting week 11 to bed and starting to look ahead here like you guys. <laughs> To, uh, week 12 and it's almost uh it's almost hard to believe but we're just about in the stretch run right now so anyways i'm in good shape here guys good to be with you yeah and if you do check us out you know on the on the youtube or on on the nfl channel streaming yeah baldy's wearing that super bowl 46 hat and i have what i think is a lukewarm take but it, okay. it tends to get pushback from patriots fans i think that is the worst loss in patriots history Number one, that Giants team was not very good. Uh, Super Bowl 46. That was the second time around. Number yeah. number two, at that point, it was the second time they had lost to the Giants. And at that point, they had had a lot of really good Patriots teams. I know no one's crying for the Patriots, but it had been yeah. seven or eight years since, and they had come up short in the end. So I was there in the stadium, and I believe that was actually the worst loss in Patriots history. Um, well, Bill Belichick is one floor below me right now. Greg. I can <laughs> go knock on his door and just see what he thinks about. <laughs> I would I go knock on his door and see what he thinks. He he seemed pretty jovial the other day with uh, <laughs> with Eli and Peyton on the, the Manning cast. So yeah. who knows? Yeah, and and that's why Baldy walked into work today rocking that Super Bowl Forty Six <laughs> hat, so he could go right to Bill Belichick's face and say, "Look at this hat, stick it, Bill." That would and be Greg. That would be an interesting question for him. I'm I'm sure if I was the coach of the team like him, maybe uh, losing the undefeated season would would stick in your craw a little more. All right, this is the preview show for Week Twelve. As always, go, we go from the smallest to the biggest spread each and every week. And, and we start with a huge matchup, Greg, in the NFC West. And guess what? It's not Niners-Rams, Baldy. It's the division-leading Arizona Cardinals and the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, the Cardinals are one-point favorite. Uh, we get Adam Amin, Mark Sanchez, and Christina Pink uh, there with this one in Seattle. Uh, the Seahawks ranked in the 30s, Baldy, in rushing efficiency defense, play-action defense, mm. and the Cardinals top 10 in both metrics. But Mike McDonald's defense looked much better against the 49ers a week ago. How do you see this going? Well, they've made a big change at linebackers, uh, Patrick. You know, they started the season. They were starting <clears throat> Terrell Dodson and Jerome Baker. They're out. The rookie, Therese Knight, is in there from UTEP. Um, and he, made a, he, he seemed to make a big difference. Uh, I think that middle layer right now, between um, uh, Knight, Therese Knight, the rookie, uh, Devin Witherspoon, I, I, they they look much better in the passing game that mm. they had. They were very good against Christian McCaffrey in the run. Last week, they really shut him down in a number of plays. They didn't give up any explosive plays. They seem like they're playing a lot better. And then, you know, just watching Geno go 80 yards in 80 seconds to win <laughs> that game. Um, Jackson Smith and Jigbo was huge. I think he's going to have a big role. Um, they look... They look if they're going to make any kind of a run in this really tightly bunched up uh, NFC West. Um, now's the time to do it. Now's the time to do it. Uh, winning on the road in San Francisco is always always nice, but Arizona is a well coached, pesky bunch. They take care of the football. They run the football well. They're going to get a good test from this Arizona Cardinal team coming off a bye week right now, and a team I think. That could be better in the second half, guys, because mm. I don't think they've really utilized Marvin Harrison Jr. well enough. That's one of his six touchdown catches right there. But I think if he if he really comes on in the second half, the way we've seen Lad McConkey and some of these rookie receivers, I think they could have a lot more points, a lot more explosion left in them offensively right now. Yeah, I, I love everything you said about the changes that the Seahawks made. It's a really interesting time for these two teams to play. I don't think you can overstay how important a win that was for Seattle. San Francisco has owned them. Seattle was already 0-2 in the division. They were going to get buried in this division early. Now they have a chance. They're, they're at home. Arizona's coming off the bye. And yes, does this Seahawks change that they made during the bye week, you get Ernest Jones in that trade. I actually thought they played very well defensively against the Rams before the bye as well. They end up losing that game 
in overtime, Matthew Stafford does Matthew Stafford things, but if they are a little more cohesive and Mike McDonald really is the, the Shanahan tree killer and he just came off two pretty good games for it. Now he's got another challenge of a very good run game and, and we'll see if they're run defense as well. And they played a lot more man coverage last week. I think that plays to the, the strengths of their team with Reek Woolen and Devon uh, Weatherspoon. And then on offense, there was a lot of changes too, Patrick, like Gino was under center a lot more. And I do think the mismatch here for the Seahawks is, is Smith and Jigba and in DK, he makes such a big difference against these cornerbacks. I know Starling Thomas and Max Melton, like they've they've played well this year, but I gotta yeah, think those, well. those are good matchups though for him. I you gotta think. Like your play our players are better than your players. What do you think, Baldy? Yeah, but I mean you look at Williams and Melton right now and Starling Thomas. I mean, pick a game. Okay. Any game here recently. I, they've played really well. They've defended the pass. They're they're not afraid to play man coverage. They've got a blitz to get pressure. Uh, but they also, uh, you know, Nick Grayless is their defense coordinator. I mean, I knew Nick when he was like a kid, you know. Like I didn't, they had to part him just to get into a pub, you know. And I, I, he's like all of 30 or 31. But his his ability to pull the perfect overload blitz at the right time, it's kind of uncanny. He's done it to Brock Purdy. He did it in the last game. He kind of times his stuff up pretty good. And they generally get home and affect the play. So, I don't know. They they just look well coached. You know, we always say this is a cliche, but it, it's but it's true. Like more games are lost than won, mm-hmm. and I feel like the Cardinals don't lose games because they beat themselves. And and, that, and that's the thing that we're maybe in hindsight we come back a few years. I call this defense the search bar because I'm always having to actually Google uh, <laughs> who, who the particular players are. But perhaps in yeah. a few years we look back, Baldy, and say. You know, this had this was a bunch of dudes uh, that came out yeah. there and played and executed well, uh, despite the fact that they really haven't been able to generate pressure uh, this season. The only team in the NFL without one defender that has 20 pressures, because that's they, they have so many guys uh, contribute to that. And, and Greg, you mentioned Geno going under center more, perhaps to protect him more. It also helped uh, that Bosa was out in that final drive of the game where they, yes. they breezed down the field. But if you can't get pressure on Geno Smith, uh, the Seahawks are going to score points. It, 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 it's just something that always happens. And so it's an intriguing matchup between two teams that I, I really almost feel the same about. Mm. And they're playing uh, in this division at this point in the year. It, it, it's I can't wait. And Kyler Murray's under center a lot more, too. The the moment where I just thought this, this Cardinals team is different, there's just something about them, is when the Jets defender absolutely blasted Kyler Murray and the helmet flew off. I, I Quincy think it was, Williams. It was Quincy Williams, okay. Yeah. And then... Kyler Murray just started yeah. laughing. He's like a yeah. crazy man. He just started laughing. And you know what he did? He, hit he completed a, what, 17 in a row, Greg? Right. And he hit a blue, like immediately after he hit a beautiful third down, I think it was to McBride into coverage. And then he hit that that dime to Harrison for the touchdown yeah. right afterwards. And I'm saying, oh, this team's different. He, they're laughing. They're laughing. <laughs> well, I mean, you can't talk about the Cardinals and not really – brag about James Conner and Buda Baker. I mean, they're the team leaders of the whole team. and But they show up every week, you know. And so uh, I give them a ton of credit. Buda's like, I mean, here we go, James Conner right now. I mean, that, <laughs> that looked like the Jets' defense, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got to laugh. But, no, I mean, this is James Conner. He's been doing it two years in a row now. Um, and, you know, and then, you know, they're starting to work Trey Benson in there. But what we're not talking about is Paris Johnson and Evan Brown and Fro Holt and, you know, Kristen Cologne uh, up front mm. right now. Like, they're doing a really good job. The tight ends, Elijah Higgins, they fit in the run game really well. McBride is a – I mean, I know he doesn't have a touchdown catch, guys. But he's – I mean, he's got everything but a touchdown catch. He's, he's a legitimate star tight end in this business right now. And you mentioned James Conner is forced to miss tackle on 37% uh, of his touches this season, even though they don't block it up. Fifth highest rate among running backs with over 50 touches. Let's leave that game, go to another big game in the NFC, also featuring a team from the division. In fact, the team the Seahawks beat last week, Greg, the San Francisco 49ers, two-and-a-half-point underdogs at the Green Bay Packers with Kevin Burkhart, uh, a couple dudes named Tom and Aaron Andrews mm. uh, on that call as we get a chance to see how San Francisco bounces back, Green Bay survives uh, what would have been a, a loss 
in the first one in a while to the Chicago Bears? How do you see it playing out? I don't know. This is the toughest game of the week to me. You can see that with the number when the home team is favored by two and a half. It's just holding up your hands because both these teams, they're, they're very similar to me in that we know they have the pieces to be good. We, we know that they're well coached. And yet I'm not totally convinced what's happening on the field for them. I'll ask you, Baldy, because it's been something I've been thinking about. Like, are the Packers good? They have an, an excellent offense and a mediocre defense, and that's that's kind of a similar formula, but I don't know if the offense is as good as it, as it was previously. Do you think the Packers are, are a good team? Well, I mean, I think they the changes they made, uh, Jeff Hefley coming in there running the defense, they, you know, they got 19 takeaways. Uh, that's something that they wanted to do. They wanted to play more man coverage. Uh, they do see vulnerable. Uh, Caleb Williams had his best game in a month last week against them. Um, you know, they had a field goal block to lose the game, which is unfortunate for Chicago. Um, I think offensively, they they can be very good. I mean, they were good replacing Jordan Love with Malik Willis. They seem to work around whatever weaknesses they have pretty well because mm-hmm. the coach is good. But I wouldn't say they're a great team. I mean, San Francisco, though, isn't either. And you can see without Kittle and without Bose in the lineup, they they were a very average team. And I don't know if McCaffrey is McCaffrey yet because he doesn't look like him. Mm. I think Jordan Mason looks, and his two carries looked a lot better. It's just very limited sample size. Maybe they want McCaffrey to be ready if they get to the postseason. But they can't get explosive plays right now in their offense. And that's something Kyle Shanahan has always – pride himself in to be able to get the ball down the field in big chunks yeah and it's unfortunate that they're having to do this again without Brandon Ayuk and, and you look back uh to the 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 trade saga and the potential of, of him leaving and the draft Ricky Pearsall uh, you kind of see it, even though Ricky Pearsall got in the end zone uh, this offense uh, really needs B.A. Uh, to be in there to, to be successful. And so we'll see how uh, they utilize Debo and CMC in this game against Green Bay, where the Packers are kind of making me think of last year's Packers, mm. where they really didn't get hot and start playing good football until later on in the season. And it's it's tough to kind of turn it on uh, to get to that spot and kind of expect that. And so we're, we're I think we're going to learn a lot about both of these teams. But I'm wondering how Jeff Halfley approaches Brock Purdy yeah. Because in that playoff game, they played zone 90% of the time against Brock Purdy. And we, we know how it turned out ultimately at the end. Uh, but Brock dealing with a shoulder injury uh, this week where Kyle Shanahan kind of mumming and tamping that down. We talked to Tom Pellicero on Fantasy Live this week saying it's not necessarily that big of a deal. I, I, I think it might be a big deal. Mm. W- with the way that everything is kind of hanging on by a thread in Santa Clara right now. Uh, they need everybody that can be 100% to be 100%. Yeah, and I think these two quarterbacks remind me more of each other than you would think because I think Brock's highs this year and even in that game last week against Seattle, they're so high, but he's a little streakier than maybe his reputation would be. And Jordan Love is like that too. He Jordan Love played awesome last week. And yeah, I think the Packers have a few more answers. Right now on third down, like for the 49ers, you know where it's going. It's going to Jennings. Like Debo is a great player and yet, it's diminishing returns using him as, as a runner. I hear you on CMC, Baldy, because he had a higher workload in that game in terms of snaps than any game all last season but one. And I'm thinking, use Jordan Mason a, a little more. I do think this is a better matchup for them because Jair Alexander is out of practice. He's really important for the Packers. We'll see if he plays. And Kenny Clark and this pass rush really hasn't gotten going. So if you give Brock Purdy time and Kyle Shanahan some, some time, they'll be able to scheme some things up, I would think. Well, I would, you know, I mean, Nick Bosa goes out of the game last week, uh, early in the third quarter. I, the injury looks serious to me. I, I don't know what his status is this yeah, week. Yeah, he's not practicing um, early in the week, I don't think. Yeah, no, but, but he, it, I mean, he was, they said it was a, a oblique muscle, but I saw him hopping on one leg off the field. So I don't know if that's the oblique or not, but um, it, when he's not in the lineup, they, there's nobody that scares you, including Leonard Floyd. There's mm. nobody in the pass rush that scares you. And so unless they blitz, and they're not a good blitzing team, um, they have a hard time pressuring the quarterback. And Geno had plenty of time to make decisions. They didn't rush him particularly well. And so, I don't know, they, they look very vulnerable defensively to me right now. Just off Baldy's like vibes and tone, now I'm thinking I'm leaning Packers. Because one thing the Packers do have, I would say, it, I, I'm confused about this team. 
like whatever the Bengals don't have, <laughs> the Packers do. Like they are winning all these games. I know you can say a field goal block's lucky or whatever, but they are finding a way to win these games where they're not at their best, and that is a skill. Well, I, I think two things specifically player-wise, right? Uh, you have a tackle-breaking runner in Josh Jacobs on offense sure. and a playmaking safety on defense in Xavier McKinney. And the, again, I'm going to echo your point. The way Baldy's talking about this non-Bosa or hurt Bosa 49ers defense, I'm picturing Josh Jacobs, uh, you know, getting the edges. The Packers have been one of the teams fortunate enough to be able to start the same five uh, up front for most of the season. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think uh, Josh Jacobs might go big in this one. That I love, like, see, at first I thought there was, this wasn't a good week. Not a lot of games between teams with a winning record, but these NFC West teams are all intriguing. Yeah, because they've all almost got winning records. <laughs> <laughs> let's do a little Sunday night football. Yeah, let's do it. In fact, uh, let's do it across the street at SoFi Stadium with two primetime games uh, this week at SoFi. The Philadelphia Eagles, two and a half point favorites, Baldy, against mm. Cooper Cup, Puka Nakua, and the Los Angeles Rams with an over under 49. Of course, it's Sunday Night Football. Mike Tirico, Chris Collinsworth, and Melissa Stark on the call. Uh, a fan base that's upset baldy uh, about one of the better teams in the <laughs> nfc uh, going up against the Rams team that's just trying to hang on in this division uh does nick sirianni uh have a happy exit from sofi on sunday night mm. well i mean they're playing great football right now um you know they've won six in a row the defense is you know ranked number one in the league not the fewest points but ranked number one the the rookies um have been fantastic for them in the secondary uh but I would say, you know, this team is all built on on Saquon. And uh, Lane Johnson told me a couple weeks ago that basically our offense is just built around running and hitting people, just running and hitting. And they do that long enough, you get these breakaway way runs. They've had 10 days since they played the commanders to get ready for this game. Um, and so they've had plenty of rest. They're pretty healthy right now as a group. Everybody is out there that needs to be out there. Uh, including Malata and A.J. Brown and some other guys that have been banged up. But I, I thought early in the year that Saquon would lead this league in rushing. I still think he's going to win the rushing title, probably total yards from scrimmage. He's just that good right now, and they're that good up front. Um, the Rams last week, they made a subtle change. They put the rookie Bo Limmer in at center. Yeah. Uh, Kyron Williams got his best game in a month. Uh, he got off, so did Blake Corum. And then uh, at the end of the day, Stafford – you know, wasn't sacked, was barely touched. They really played well up front. And when you look at the run that they made a year ago, around starting around this time, it started with the offensive line really coming together. Avila, you know, Bo Limmer, Dotson, like they, they played well last week. They got to play great this week. Because if you give Stafford time with his receivers, I don't care who's covering. Like he's going he's gonna to find those guys right now. Yeah, I this is such a good matchup because you can look at the Rams record and see five and five, but they're four and one in their last five games. That's that's about the level they're playing at. And it was fascinating because you mentioned they put Limmer in at center and they have played good games with him at center lately when he's been out there. That inc that means the Jonah Jackson signing. They're almost taking an L on that right now. They gave him thirty four million dollars guaranteed. He is right now going to be coming off the bench just as a, a sixth offensive lineman. But that shows they believe in the group that that they have and it just wasn't work, working out. I think it's such an interesting battle of the trenches because, yeah, the offensive line for L.A. has gotten better. The defensive line for Philly has also been getting better, but that defense might be a little more back to front where it's the secondary helping out the guys up front. But then you flip it around, and Patrick, and I think of these, these pass rushers for the Rams, these young pass rushers who we have been talking about and love. What a test for them to have to face – in run defense, these road graders that the Eagles have and to try to get to Jalen Hurts when when he does drop back to pass like this is a big time test for these young players for the Rams. It's a defense that the team that's got five wins and those those five wins this season, they have a pressure rate of 45 percent or higher. Mm. It's the, the largest number of games of that particular uh, stat category in the entire NFL. And if I'm not mistaken, it is all five of those wins. As much credit yeah. as we want to give Matthew Stafford and, and when these two receivers are there, uh, Braden Fisk and Jared Verse, uh, Young, th this this defensive line uh, is played incredible. But on the other side, Landon Dickerson, Jordan Mailata, Lane Johnson, uh, who's allowed just 15 pressures and two sacks the entire season. It, it's, it feels hard. You Considering all that, the way that the Eagles are playing 
the matchup with the offensive line and the defensive line, it's, it's hard to go away it, from Philly. It's going to be hard. I, I think they could pull it off, but I like the extra rest. Baldy, I want to ask you about Jalen Hurts. I, I don't know what to think about Jalen Hurts this season using the eye test. So I want you know better. What do you think? Well, I mean, look, he played, I don't know, two or three games. Well, three game, two games for sure, probably three, without Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard, and A.J. Brown. So, I mean, you know, they, they had their backups in their playing. Like, that's one thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the offense has adjusted as the season. They're playing a, a lot more play action. Players went during the bye week, talked to Nick, going, look, we can't have the quarterback holding the ball five seconds. Like, it's not right to the offensive line. Um, and so they did adjust. They're a little, little bit more right there. Play action. Uh, Jalen's doing a little bit better of getting the ball out quicker. But, you know, he's, he's cut way down on the turnovers in the six-game win streak. Uh, he's not turning it over. He's taking care of the football better. And so I think he's playing a lot better football. And you have to account for him as a runner in any situation, whether it's the tush push, whether it's a scramble, whether it's a design run. He's an excellent runner, and he's healthy right now. So a couple of these years, he hadn't really been healthy this time of the year. And so you have to account for him, and he's difficult. He's a real good complement to Saquon right now. And he loves throwing the deep ball to A.J. Brown. That's his big play guy. And so he trusts him to go get it. So I think he's playing really well. And he's a perfect guy in this style of offense that Kellen Moore's running. Yeah, I think that's really well said, especially saying he's a compliment. And that's sort of how this offense has evolved. That's where I've settled in, too, is that, yeah, sometimes he holds on to the ball a little bit, but he's a big playmaker. They get a lot of big plays. They're set up by the run. His running is helped. And so I'm, I'm forecasting where I'm going to be when we talk QB Island in a week and a half <laughs> with Jalen Hurts because he deserves, I, I think, to be on QB Island. And, yeah, you, you got two of the most valuable wide receivers in football in this game. You can see the A-B test. When A.J. Brown is not on the field, different Eagles team. When Puka Nakua is not on the field, different Rams team. They're, they're about as good as it gets. Yeah, and, and glad that all four of these guys are, are able to play uh, in this game and we, and we get a chance to see it on Sunday Night Football at SoFi Stadium. It's going to mm-hmm. be a fantastic uh, event and, and experience, I, I think, for all, because, you know, we've got some primetime games up here in the next uh, couple of weeks that aren't going to be as fun as the <laughs> ones we get uh, on Sunday and Monday. I know. They didn't they didn't flex <laughs> out the Browns Broncos. I was really surprised about that. Yeah. They're leaving that one in there. Yeah. Anyways, it's one of those uh, do overs that, that we'd like to add on right. uh, <laughs> where uh, uh, note before we move on. The Eagles have gone under center way more. They went from 8.7% under center in weeks one through four uh, since the bye. 21% of the time uh, Jalen Hurts lining up uh, under center probably a lot to do with uh, Saquon uh, being the, the guy on that offense and Jalen Hurts kind of taking a step back uh, to becoming uh, the, the compliment uh, to their all-star. I don't know. You, probably, you might have that num- this number, Pat, but the, the Eagles have run the ball 98 more times than they've thrown it. Like, it's a huge disparity, the yeah. most in the NFL. I think they're right around 56 or 57% Ooh. run first. And you look at the teams that are winning, Buffalo, uh, you look at Detroit, you look at some of these teams, Washington, that are winning. They're running it more than they're throwing it. The trend is strong. Mm. But Philadelphia is at the very top of that list. This might be the like the most Brian Baldinger Eagles team we've seen in a long time. Like since since Jerome Brown was out there wreck, wreaking havoc in the backfield. Well, I, I I have to listen to some of the offense linemen gripe at me on Mondays <laughs> when they don't run it enough. So I have to I have to listen to some of the stuff. That's awesome. All right, we'll go from that primetime game to another. It's time for hot matchups presented by Wingstop. The Baltimore Ravens, a two and a half point favorite at SoFi Stadium on Monday Night Football against the Chargers with an over under of 50. Joe Buck, Troy Oakman, Lisa Salters on the call. Uh, Greg, we saw a score fest against the Chargers last time out. In comes a hurt Baltimore Ravens defense that couldn't stop anybody when they're healthy. Uh oh. Are there 80 points scored in this football? Patrick, not happy with this defense. I, look, they're coming off one of their better games of the year, at least. I've been saying all year when this Ravens team loses that great teams respond and I expect them to respond and, and they have, they, it's after that Raiders loss, I guess they didn't in weeks one and two, but, but they bounced back uh, in the last two games after a loss 
And I think they will here as well. I just want to know, can the Chargers and their pressure group, and Khalil Mack wasn't out there last week. He would help a lot if he returns. Joey Bosa looked better. They, he played a lot more last week, so that helped them out a lot. Can they consistently get pressure? Can they be as disciplined as the last two teams that have faced the Ravens? Because if they can, and they've been quite good at, at getting pressure, then I, I do think they have a chance in this game to, to hold that Ravens offense down. Well, it's really amazing what the Chargers are doing. They're starting two rookie corners, two fifth-round picks on the corner, corners, mm-hmm. one in the slot, one outside, Cam Hart, and Christian Fulton's the other corner. They, they, they held up, and they, they played great against Joe Burrow in the fourth quarter. Now, Joe had some unbelievable plays, too, to get him to tie it up. But, um, I, you know, Dayon Henley is a guy that I don't know if people talk about him out there enough. Uh, I don't – nationally, they don't, but he's – He's a phenomenal – he never comes off the field. And he wears number zero for the Chargers, second-year player. Like, he kind of does everything for him, uh, including blitz. And so when they want to get pressure, extra pressure, they will blitz him. Uh, they will bring Derwin James off the edge. They'll do what they have to do because they feel like they're tackling much better in the secondary and they're holding up in man coverage much better than they were uh, at any point under Brandon Staley. Yeah, this is why you got to listen to NFL Daily. Even going back to training camp, I was at Chargers camp. I asked our guy, Matt Money-Smith, like, who, who's the Chargers player standing out that, that, that they love? And his name was Dayon Henley, that this guy they really think is going to be the dude. I thought that was interesting because they, they drafted someone. They, they brought in free agents. Uh, but he was right on it in early August. That's, that's why you got to listen, Patrick. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> of course. Of course I listen to NFL Daily. Glad to be a part uh, of this franchise, I Greg. Leads, I think he leads everybody in the Chargers by, like, over 40 tackles yeah. mm. in total tackles so far this year. And and this is a game uh, for him to have a, another big performance uh, in prime time going up against this Ravens offense that has accumulated 598 yards before contact on outside runs uh, mm. this season as they kind of got the, the O-line situation figured out early. Uh, we were waiting for him to get the defensive situation figured out, Greg, where Justin Herbert, when he is not pressured, averages 3.2 more yards per attempt uh, when you don't get pressure on Justin Herbert and this team has struggled to generate pressure. I think back to the Broncos game where Bo Nix was back there forever uh, in the first half. And, and now we see Herbo with Quentin Johnston really coming on, Baldy. Uh, people kind of overrated those drops in his rookie season. Turns out if you can get open, it's still a valuable skill set, and he's been able to do that. So it's 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 hard to picture anything other than just a whole bunch of points here mm. uh, in this game just from both teams. I love a score fest. I would prefer to not have the stress. Uh, yeah, but, but but score fest. Why not? Bald, Baldy Patrick's a, a closet Ravens fan. It's no longer, out. no longer in the closet. So uh, wh- what do you think? How do you think his defense, the secondary, holds up here? I, I I announced that game in Pittsburgh last week with the Ravens. You know they they you know Derrick Henry got it knocked out of his hands by Nick Herbig on the second play of the game um, that led to points. You know they uh, Peyton Wilson, the rookie, ripped the ball you know right out of uh, Justice Hill's hands on a wheel route, you know, they got three takeaways, which really, really helped uh, the Steelers in their offense and the points. Uh, Justin Tucker, I'm not sure what to think, like, uh, because he's missing extra points and field goals regularly right now. But the thing that's bizarre to me about this team is if they're behind or if they want to throw it, they take Derrick Henry off the field. And there's long stretches of games, uh, games against Cincinnati this year where they, they had to win late or in overtime or even last week where Henry's not on the field. And honestly, I mean, Justice Hill's fine. He's a good player, but he doesn't scare you. Maybe Keaton Mitchell will. He didn't get much uh, play last week. But I thought they got good pressure, Mm. you know, on uh, Lamar last week, enough where it really affected the way that he played. And so I think that's the key. When you can pressure Lamar and make him try to be Houdini back there regularly, um, when you take the threat of Derrick Henry and the big runs away, they seem to – look a little bit more pedestrian than what the statistics mm. say right now. Mm, that's a great point. And yeah, I just think there's too many penalties for, from this team, Baltimore on both sides of the ball. They're, they're leading the league. Just, just a little sloppy. See if they can get it going. One mismatch in this game, I, I think is when the chargers run the ball. I, they just haven't been consistent in terms of their success rate, consistently being able to run. Ravens have been able to stop it. So I think it's going to have to be all Herbo. And he's shown that he can do it. He's going to be going up against Trey White, who is 
had some good snaps for the Ravens last week. We'll see how that goes. Before we move on, I do want to play this clip of Jim Harbaugh in the locker room after last week's game. And if there was any doubt about how much this team is buying in, uh, you can forget about it now. This could be one of the best high fives ever. Yeah. Oh. Give each other high fives! Yeah. <laughs> Derwood James is so intense in this. <laughs> I mean, they've got them like they're just like that's the good stuff, right, Baldy? Well, it's interesting, you know. Obviously, J.K. Dobbins, you know, finished that game off with 18 seconds ago with that touchdown run. And you know, there've been a lot of coaches, like maybe that one in Chicago, that says, "All right, we got the ball at the 26 yard line. Let's just kick the field goal." And he ta- he runs another play. And J.K. takes it to the house and game over. And Chicago does, and they just kick a field goal with 30 seconds ago, and they get it blocked. Like, there's just something about the way mm. that Harbaugh just has their pulse and knows when to be. They're not a big, crazy, fourth down, go for it team. They're not like that. They take the points that are there. They kick field goals, all that stuff. But there is, like, an attack mentality that he still does. You're seeing the ball to Will Disley last week. I never thought Will Disley could run a seam route. I never seen him run one. <laughs> they, they hit him on two of them last week. You know, and all of a sudden, the ball's going down the field, and I thought – You know, as much as I want to see the Chargers win and pulling for Harbaugh and it's good for L.A., L.A. sports, all that, I thought, like, they're not going to – this is a showtime city. you got to put some points on the board. you got to be fun. and They're starting to look a little bit more like showtime right now, the way they played that game last week. Yeah, and the crowd was jamming some of the videos that came from that. That was probably the best moment of – in Chargers, so far, it's brief history, I think, was that J.K. Dobbins I think you're right. touchdown because they went absolutely crazy. So I, I love it. I love that the, the atmosphere there, it, it has really taken hold. Um, that was it for uh, for Hot Matchups presented by Wingstop. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back. We got Baldy for a couple more games before he moves on to one of his many other jobs. Back on NFL Daily, and yes, every week we go from the smallest spread to the biggest spread. It doesn't always mean the best games are up top, but it worked out that way this week, so we got the good stuff with Baldy, because this NFC North game to me is a lot more intriguing than, than it was a week ago, just on paper. Much more. In, in fact, if that kick, <laughs> the circumstances change with that kick, it gets a little more interesting. It's the Minnesota Vikings, three and a half point favorites, Baldy, at the Chicago Bears, who suffered the heartbreaking loss. Uh, they get a chance to face their old friend Aaron Jones. Uh, once again, Kevin Kugler, Daryl Johnston, and Laura Oakman on the call. Over under is 39, not a lot of points expected in this. We saw Sam Darnold play well against the defense that started the season well. Uh, the Bears started the season well. What's Sam look like this time, Baldy? Well, I think he's playing just fine. You know, I mean, he's got a lot of targets to throw to. They've replaced the left tackle, which was looked like it was going to be a difficult loss. They made a good trade to get Cam Robinson in there. That helped. Um, he's not Darisol, but he, he's a lot better than their backup they had. So, you know, like they, they've got good balance. They're well coached. They do a lot of creative things in the passing game to help Sam out, whether it's putting Justin Jefferson in the backfield. I mean, there's a million different things they do. And Aaron Jones um, has been fantastic for them. As good as Josh Jacobs has been for Green Bay, Aaron Jones has been that guy. Um, He doesn't miss a hole. His vision is unreal. And he's just a great receiver. So they got everything rolling right now offensively. I think they've got what it takes. And then defensively, you know, they take the ball away. I think they've got 16 interceptions right now. They give the offense a lot of extra at-bats. So I think they play pretty good complementary football up in Minnesota right now. Yeah, I've been really interested to see how Brian Flores has sort of backed off all the blitzes the last three weeks, that maybe it was matchup related. He just wanted to confuse like a Will Levis, let's say, with just guys in coverage. But they went from being at the top of the league in terms of their blitz rate to the last three weeks being about average, being about 13th. And they've now installed so many different crazy things in this Flores defense over the last year and a half that I feel like with this veteran crew and when, when Cashman's out there, they're doing all these disguise pressures. And look, I'm not, I'm not a football coach, but I can see that 
they're throwing a lot at these opposing quarterbacks. They now have such a menu of different options that they can go to and these veteran players who can execute it at a high level that you don't know what's going to happen week to week. And, and spinning that to this week's game, I thought Caleb Williams was fantastic in that game a week ago. Easily his best game to me, even better than the one in London because of the types of plays he had to make. And I'm really curious how Flores decides to attack him because his legs obviously were a big part of, of their offense early. And I would think that'd be maybe job one is, is trying to prevent that from happening. Well, he also got the ball out quicker. Yeah, he, he dropped his time to throw almost a half a second from 2.9 seconds to start the season to in week 11 against Green Bay, 2.42 seconds, uh, making decisions to get the ball out of his hands. Now, another thing that that did, it really decreased the air yards per attempt to DJ Moore, who was mainly doing his work uh, on screen games and the outside. So it kind of takes the downfield threat away from DJ, but it gets some catchable balls, uh, something that he struggled to get uh, during that bad stretch uh, for the Bears offense where it's we don't necessarily it, – it, we're trying to figure out uh, what this Bears team and offense is going to look like. It's kind of changed week week to week. And so now we get two weeks in a row of, of, of an offensive coordinator where – some positive things to believe with that they always they almost came away with the win against the Green Bay Packers so I, I'm excited to see just what version of the Chicago Bears we, we get Baldy well I mean to Greg's point here Patrick you know they lost to uh, Detroit and the Rams back-to-back -back weeks and they gave up basically 30 points a game and all that blitzing uh, cost them um, you know when they played real experienced quarterbacks right now and, and, and Stafford and Goff and so he backed off I think because of that, and so we can still win playing a more traditional style. Now, I think they're going to throw a lot of junk at Caleb because the offense line in front of him isn't very good. And so, you know, whether it's attacking Matt Pryor or attacking, you know, uh, Darnell Wright or whoever, I, I mean, I think there's some matchups that they know they can win. So they might, they might do a little bit more than what they have done this week to see how Caleb handles it. Like, I know Caleb played better last week, but – I don't know. Like, I'm not a big fan of the quarterback running nine times. He gained 70 yards. A lot of them were scrambles. I understand a couple design read option runs, okay, to get yourself, you know, uh, you know, five or six yards on first down or get or convert a third down. But there's a lot of runs where, I mean, he's taken off at the first sign that there's some mm. pressure. And I think it's too soon still. So we'll see how patient he is because this is not the team you want to do that to. No, and it, that'll be tricky. And they've been getting pressure without blitzing. That's the thing is Jonathan Grenard and, and Van Ginkle, like those are good players. It's a good test for Darnold too. I'm really fascinated by this game. I'm looking forward to it because Darnold's coming off a, a really great game against Tennessee. But the, the running game hasn't been as consistent for the Vikings lately. Maybe it was matchup base. We'll see. But this is a team, the Bears, that you want to run the ball against. It, they're a tough secondary to to throw consistently against and, and man the Vikings have they just been about perfect beating everyone they should you mentioned the two losses like that, that was a road game in LA that that's a t those are two tough games that they lost but all the teams that they should beat they have which is really impressive they are at eight and two uh also impressive Baldy's arms right there he's showing them off oh. the, the biceps he's still getting the the pump in uh, when he's not by the pool or grinding tape. Uh, we appreciate yes. you, Baldy. Thank you for uh, for joining us. Great. Thanks uh, for having me, Patrick. Good good seeing my buddies up there in L.A. Keep it down. I hope to get out there one of these days, maybe during the playoffs or whatever. So uh, call me anytime. Happy to join you guys, man. love breaking this stuff down. I, I love having you. Appreciate you, Baldy. And, yes, Baldy. Okay. please let yeah. us know when, when, when you're guys. back in L.A. Uh, we'll be holding it down here in the Chris Wesley Podcast Studio. Yeah. So we still got a bunch of – games to go here Patrick yeah let's go to a team that blew out the Atlanta Falcons a week ago now Bo Nix and the Denver Broncos go on the road where they are five and a half point favorites against the Las Vegas Raiders and Brock Bowers Kevin Harlan aka God Trent Green and Melanie <laughs> Collins uh, on this game looking forward to will it be a game for them Greg because other than Brock Bowers uh, what, are, what are we excited about in Las Vegas right now nothing I don't know what to say about the the Raiders. I used to kind of think when you, you see this on shows, right? Get You get towards the end of the year, it's a bad team. You just start skipping those teams. Or it's just <laughs> people don't know what to say. And I'm like, well, that's lazy. You know, you got to, there's always things to find that are interesting. There's little angles to talk about. But this Raiders is tough for me. Beyond Bowers, who's awesome. 
it's tough. I don't know. I don't know what to say about this team anymore. To me, it's just more of a test of how much is Sean Payton cooking? Can they, can they be a team that does what they did last week, which is not just win the games you're supposed to win. And they're, they've gotten quite good at, at that, but cover five and a half points on the road in the division. Cause that's a different sort of team that to me is a playoff team. I don't know if they, they win games in the playoffs, but if you're the type of team that you're that reliable with a rookie quarterback on a week to week basis to take care of what you need to, because your line play is so good on, on both sides of the ball. I, I just give Peyton all the credit in the world. Cause he is creating some open receivers for Knicks. I want to give Knicks credit. He, he's got three or four throws each game that he was not making early in the season, but also man, I'm not going to give him that much credit for the two touchdowns <laughs> where he just throws a snow smoke route. Like one of them's on third and goal at the 14, the type of throw that's like, Oh, why are you throwing that? It's a give up play. And like Mims is just walking into the end zone. And there was another one like that, like two things can be true. Peyton can be absolutely in his bag and Nick's can be doing what he needs to do. Yes. Yeah, so both things uh, can be true. And that's why I, I feel comfortable with the five and a half points because I think Denver does win the game. Uh, and we have seen it late in several games this season. Sean Payton will run it up. And I'm not, <laughs> not, not being critical at all. They're just no, he cares about stats, and I like that. He cares about the numbers. Uh, but, hey, uh, something interesting about the Raiders. I, I just pulled up spot rec. Uh, Jack Jones is going to be an unrestricted free agent in 2026. <laughs> Maybe there's that. Uh, we, could, we could keep our eye uh, on Max Crosby, who has uh, been not like the typical – Max Crosby type season, uh, but he does lead the team in pressures, 16 quick pressures, uh, which is very important, very valuable, uh, which is uh, pressures under two and a half seconds. Other than that, we've, we've got Gardner Minshew starting another game. Uh, we've discussed Brock Bowers, who had a rookie record with 13 catches. Uh, it, it would have been noticed more in the fantasy community if Taysom Hill didn't go nuclear. Uh, last noticed week. by me in my fantasy community. <laughs> I beat the number one team in my league with, with help there it from is. Brock. Yeah. See, Congratulations to Brock Bowers for powering Greg uh, to the win there. But but then on top of that, Vance Joseph's defense uh, playing very, very well. An issue, and again, we, we have to asterisk the Kirk Cousins performances where I don't really know what was going on with the Atlanta Falcons offense uh, this past week. It's tough to evaluate whether that was mostly Broncos or, or mostly I Falcons. give Broncos credit because we haven't really seen that yeah. consistently out of Kirk. I give it to, to the offense too, actually. Because it's complimentary. I don't think Kirk played bad in the first half of that game. There just weren't many drives, and they settled for a couple field goals, and and one ended in in a funky way with a penalty. And then suddenly you're down 21-6, and and these pass rushers are are just getting after you. I I think the last thing I'll say on this game is just I think Sean Payton and this team kind of had a statement of intent. They haven't given out many new big contracts to – holdover player since he got there. It's a bunch of new guys. They gave a big contract right before the season to the man with the belly, Quinn Miners. Mm -hmm. Not a nationally known name, but just kind of a lunch pail, (laughs) really strong guard. And that that actually, I think, was a little bit of a statement of intent of like, this is where we're going to try to be good. And they really have been. Yeah, I remember because I was in Denver for training camp and it was before the Sertan deal. And I asked Patrick, I was like, hey, um, how much do you think about this? He's like, oh, I'm not worried about it. And I was like, oh, OK. And then a few weeks later, hey, big money uh, going to number two as well. So congratulations to a team that we think uh, is playoff bound uh, in the Denver Broncos. Well, maybe not. I don't know. Spoiler alert. We'll see. I do. Oh, well, there we go. We both think the Broncos are going to the playoffs. That's which is bad news for the Bengals. That's kind of the team that they need to fall off. Uh, Let's go to a team that is not going to the playoffs. In fact, um, might be making more changes as the Tampa Bay Buccaneers get Mike Evans back. They are six-point favorites against Tommy DeVito and the New York Giants. Andrew Catalan, Tiki Barber, Jason McCourty, and A.J. Ross on the call. The over-under is 41.5 points. Greg, I was thinking for the past few weeks that this would be Drew Locke. There's questions about whether or not Drew Locke's contract plays into the decision as well as Danny Dimes. No, I don't buy that. Not at all? I don't. Not even all the DeVito, smallest bit. All DeVito, all the time, no question. The the Giants are not starting Tommy DeVito okay. because Drew Locke has like $500,000 in incentives. <laughs> and by the way, if you looked at those incentives, the incentives were based on Drew Locke being great. He's not like he wasn't even going to hit those incentives. I don't buy that for a second. I truly believe Dry- Brian Dable does not like Drew Locke. <laughs> like he just he doesn't, doesn't like, like it. He doesn't like a few people. This is, this is a he, thing. He, and he likes Tommy DeVito. Yeah. yeah. 
So I, I truly believe he does not like how Drew Block, Drew Lock plays football. Maybe even personally with some of the ways that they've. <laughs> I've just been noticing some of the like little things they say. I just something's going on there. It's weird. Yeah, and, and it's it's been it's been a couple of years, and they do it. Uh, start Devito at home a, against a, a Bucks team that has been fighting, Greg, scrapping and clawing since Chris Godwin and Mike Evans go down in that loss to the Baltimore Ravens. Mike Evans practicing this week. The big piece of the offense, literally and figuratively, comes back. Uh, MVP MVP Baker back, right? With Mike Evans back? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to go that far, but it's no. funny. Since I gave you the most grief about <laughs> talking to him about the MVP, I actually think on balance he's played better, more mm-hmm. consistently. You know who he is on a week-to-week basis. The numbers are great. There was that game against the 49ers before their bye where at a certain point it was like, okay, the ball's coming out too quick. At, like he was barely holding it. It was like a touch pass. He was getting the snap and immediately it's just like, it was like a push pass. And it was like, it's hard to build an offense that way. Like it's all running backs and tight ends. Cause their, their wide receivers just aren't those dudes. Mm-hmm. But now you get that dude back. And I mentioned Puka and AJ Brown, the difference between when they're on the field and not, I don't think Mike Evans is at that level anymore. I think that's fair to say. But he's close. And for this team, he's so important. And what a great week. My my most lukewarm take, because I don't think it's that hot a take, okay. is that the Bucks are still going to win this division. Maybe that's a medium take. I, I yeah. It, it I'm was. Gonna, I'm going to put it out there on Blue Sky and see what people think. It was much warmer before the Falcons went and got dominated. Right. In, but that's what I was expecting to start happening. Not dominant, but just them to come back to earth. Uh, one thing that's really come back to earth is the opportunity for Malik Neighbors. Uh, since week five, Darius Slayton's actually the leading receiver on this team. Is that probably also a, a DeVito spot? Do we go to Tommy Cutlets because Dimes was not feeding Malik? That w- That's an interesting theory. I just got to imagine it's something to do with the defenses and how they're coming after Neighbors. Although... They managed to get it to him earlier. I mean, Dimes wasn't hitting balls down the field. I don't know if if Devito <laughs> he will. Both of them on the on the flea flicker. <laughs> right. I don't. I don't know if Devito will. I know Dexter Lawrence said that's my best friend on the team. He's also the best quarterback on the team. They came in together in that draft class that Dave Gettleman, you know, probably set the franchise back a little with that pick <laughs> with Daniel Jones, and yet got an all pro with pick number 17. So that's, you know, batting 500. That's not that bad for, for drafting. I, I really want to see them take advantage now that Evans is on the field of how good these running backs are playing. I'm really impressed by Bucky Irving and Rashad white. It is a really nice combination. They're complimentary. Rashad white's so good on passing downs, really good pass blocker. Irving makes people miss. These, These are the bizarro bucks. It's all about the running backs again. And I hope that their defense comes out of the bye with some solutions because they just it just wasn't the Bucks defense we're used to seeing. Antoine Winfield was not the Antoine Winfield we're used to seeing. Right. He, he, I don't think, has been healthy this year, so hopefully the week off helps him, and I think it was a hamstring injury that he was playing through. It's it's a, it's an interesting bind uh, that it, when it comes in where you, at least coming into the game, you see the game script. If it's a passing game script, then you know Rashad White. If it's a rushing game script, you know Bucky Irving. But do you want to tip the plays uh, by, by having them back there and doing that? And how do they approach that? Uh, not as much, we think, uh, of a problem. Uh, I'm, I'm Go fine. make a run, Bucks. I'm, I'm, a- I'm, I'm fine with six points, Greg. I'm not. Uh, I'm oh. going to – I'll take the Giants covering that six on uh, game debut. And I'm on a heater right now on game debut, so you watch sure out. But I still would take the Bucks to win this game and start – Beating the the poor sisters of the NFL. You got the Panthers. You got the Raiders next. Like, let's stack some wins. But Cutlets does not have the Giants in that category. Greg Rosenthal, <laughs> a believer. Maybe I can talk Greg into picking the Giants. No, uh, no right, chance. No we're chance. at home. Uh, speaking of teams that Greg loves, the New England Patriots at the Miami Dolphins, who are a seven and a half point favorite. Spiro Didis, mm. uh, Adam Archuleta, and our friend Adida Kikabwala on the call. The Dolphins defense playing spectacularly, Greg in these past few weeks uh, to go with a complimentary performance but by their offense where uh, Tua and company taking care of the ball, Chanu Smith uh, really getting involved. Is is Drake May enough to beat the Dolphins? Probably not because I think Miami just has better personnel and better coaching overall. We went back and forth, Jordan Rodriguez and I, about Alex Van Pelt on the last show. And at <laughs> You know what? They have made more sense. They've looked like an NFL offense and, and maybe give him some grace to that. It, 
took a little while to get it going. You, you got the new quarterback, but I think it's mostly Drake May making them look better. But it has been better. They're finding ways to get to Mario Douglas and Kendrick Bourne open, and those are your two best players. Kendrick Bourne makes a huge difference on this offense. He didn't play a snap. No one cares about the Patriots, but he didn't play a snap two weeks ago, and like no one talked about it. I'm sh- I'm sure it was like a team discipline move, and yet there was like no reporting on it whatsoever. Anyways. <laughs> I don't know if the Dolphins' defense is playing that well. I oh. don't think they played well last week, actually. You give up four straight drives of, like, 14 plays to the Raiders and give up a lot of points per drive. I know, I don't think they played that well. They're a very unpredictable group. Jalen Ramsey is playing great. Their linebackers, kind of like the Seahawks, they figured it out. They're different with Sealer and, and Campbell in there together. Chop Robinson's playing better. So I'm talking myself into it, but I do not think that was a good performance against Gardner Minshew. It, why, how do you let Brock Bowers just... Be open. What, he's, what he's the, the only, only guy. Option? Well, maybe Jacoby Myers is just too much okay, of a factor. Okay, they okay. they get him back. Uh, I do want to shout out seventeen year veteran Calais Campbell, uh, top eleven in pressure rate among defensive tackles uh, this season, still doing it, playing at, at a very high level. I'm glad that both Steve and Jordan were able to tag team you to get you off of this Alex Van Pelt mission of justice, where. You were bemoaning it, and now here we are a week later. Oh, I don't feel that much differently. The (laughs) offensive line's still trash. I'm just saying it looks more like an NFL offense. It it makes a little more sense to me. By the way, we asked Anthony Weaver, the defensive coordinator of the Miami Dolphins, on this very program, NFL Daily, about Calais Campbell. He had some great stuff, and that's going to be part of the Thursday night recap show. So check, listen for that. This was the game, Christian Gonzalez's rookie year, which made me and, and plenty of film watchers believe that this young man could be a really special pro because he played man-to-man on Tyreek for most of that game, and you just don't see that. Tyreek got one on him, but for the most part, he really battled. So I'm really looking forward to that. They didn't use Gonzalez that way against Puka Nakua last week, and everyone got all up in arms about it. So we'll see if that's what they do this week. That would be really fun because he's been a little under the radar, but... I still have all my Christian Gonzalez stock. I think he's been fantastic this year. If he doesn't make the Pro Bowl this year, he will in future years. And I I think he could make it this year. That's how good he's been. The foundational pieces. Greg loves them. Christian Gonzalez, uh, Drake May. We'll see how things go uh, for those (laughs) New England Patriots. I'm looking forward to it. Speaking of Alex Van Pell, I'm glad you brought this up. Okay. (laughs) Get him. I'm not getting him. Oh, okay. Um, There was a story by Albert Breer, our old coworker that Robert Kraft was calling around asking, like, who would be the right offensive mind to pair with Drake May? And this really got under Gerard Mayo's skin to the point where he addressed it publicly, I believe, multiple times. And once, I think, even unprompted about just these reports are totally, this is bogus, and I believe in my guy, and Van Pelt, and he's been really pumping up Van Pelt that he should get a lot of the credit, and we love Van Pelt. And it felt a little bit like a doth protest too much situation. But just interesting that maybe me and Robert Kraft are on the same page here. He might be looking around to to see. Or or he just calls folks. He he has a conversation. Okay. Maybe it got out there. A game of literal. I know how the game is played. I mean, it's interesting that that is just out there. Let's take a quick break because we got more games to get to. A fun game. I said all the good games were up top, uh, but a fun game coming up between the Lions and the Colts. Back after, after this. Back on NFL Daily. I feel bad because I think I took this game in terms of our assignments on Sunday. Don't feel bad. Colts, Lions. It's fun. It's a fun game. A fun game with a couple teams. The the Detroit Lions, seven and a half point favorites against Anthony Richardson coming off a win against the Jets that I loved and hated because of a dumb pick that I made. 50 and a half. <laughs> the over under Kenny Albert, Jonathan Vilba, and Megan Olivia get to watch, Greg, this Detroit Lions offense that aside from that random night, Sunday night in Houston, has been on fire for a month plus. Uh, Amon Ross St. Brown looking to extend his touchdown streak to nine games. He's already got a franchise wow. record. Wow. This, what, what, what do Anthony Richardson and the Colts and the Colts defense and Gus Bradley, how can they contend with this juggernaut right now, Greg? 
I don't think they can defensively. We're at the point where you see seven and a half for the Lions on the road against a, a competitive team, yeah. like an average team is what I would call the Colts. And you think like, eh, it's probably not enough. Like, because <laughs> just on that side of the ball, it's always, it's always a mismatch. DVOA numbers go back to the eighties or to, I think the late seventies now. And that's like a total efficiency metric that, that I really love that evaluates play by play. It takes opponents into account through 10 weeks of the season. They're, they're third all time. The two teams ahead of them were the 07 Patriots and the 93 Washington team, which are two of the greatest teams of all time. Or was it the 91 team uh, in Washington? Like there's no chance the Colts have enough answers defensively. Now, the other side of the ball is more interesting, and the Colts' defense, I think, has played better, but let's not get carried away. Like, the, the Jets put up 27 points in the end against them. The, this Colts' defense, to me, is hoping to be average, and like, the Lions, they just... It's the most consistent thing in the world, by the way, is if you own Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery in fantasy, <laughs> like my son does. He, he drafted them both. And, like, literally every single week they come through. Every single week they come through. Yeah, the, the highest rush success rate on design runs uh, this season where they only get contacted behind the line of scrimmage 35% uh, of the time. It, it's all, And with both David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs, who can make you miss uh, in the open field in two different ways, uh, I think people kind of conceptualize Jameer Gibbs as the home run hitter. But when David Montgomery's breaking tackles like he is, I, I mean, you get explosive plays uh, off of that as well. That combined with... Golf and Amon Ross St. Brown. Jamo comes back from the suspension. He scores the long touchdown. Looks great. It's there, there's so much to deal with. Not to mention Sam Laporta. I guess I am mentioning here. Uh, Tim Patrick flashing across the screen as we look like they're, they're, and they're indoors. I always like them a little better indoors. When I like any offense better indoors, and they will be indoors. Maybe they'll maybe they'll open up the roof at Lucas Field. The other side of the ball is more interesting. Like, yes. What do you think about? Jonathan Taylor needing to get going because they actually, he actually really didn't against the Jets. No. It was kind of concerning. Clearly, Shane Steichen went into that game saying, we're going to win by running the ball. The very first play of the game was a quarterback power run to the outside. Outside Didn't really work. To be honest, Anthony Richardson's runs didn't really work no, other, other than the goal line runs. So that worries me because I think matchup-wise, I think I'd much rather be a team that is pass first against the Lions they're very good stopping the run. They're pretty tough up front. I think the best way to beat the Lions is a true drop back passer that can really sling it. And that's as good as Richardson was. And he hit some very difficult throws last week. I think that, that's a tough ask. Yeah. Uh, throws with a high degree of difficulty. I think the completion percentage over expected uh, in the positive side for Anthony Richardson. And, and I think this game at the very least changes uh, the perception of, of Anthony Richardson where he had those those bad games against good defenses. And then Joe Flacco comes in, and, and of course that whole charade happens. Uh, but he, he gets his job back. And here it's... The, the Claybon victory lap on poor Joe uh, Flacco. Yeah. It's unseemly, frankly, you know. I'm, it's, it's, not, it's not on Joe Flacco. It, it, this is not, nothing personal against Joe. I'm just evaluating uh, the things that I see, much as the, the way that uh, you feel about I <laughs> love Alex it. Van Pelt. No, I love it. It's, I love seeing Patrick, like, subtly spike the football. You're just so professional about it that uh, I, I just wanted I to know it. I wouldn't say that. I, I will literally uh, spike a football. I'm just, I'm glad he's playing. <laughs> I'm glad he's back playing. He gets a chance to to develop and be, I, I think, the player that, that he can be. And when it doesn't work against the Detroit Lions, uh, people aren't going to say, oh, he's, you know, he's not viable. It's like, oh, well, he's playing against a good football team. The other team's going up and down the field at will. Uh, we just need to give him some time. Yeah, the Lions rush defense is fourth in success rate. Uh, over the last month, they've got playmaking safeties who love to come down, especially Brian Branch in the in the box. So, I I do think this is a tough matchup. Like like I said, because of just the way that I I think you need to be able to beat the Lions. And I do not think this will be the fourth game that the Lions win by more than thirty five points. <laughs> I think it'll be much more competitive. But I do worry that Anthony Richardson, just because of the game script, will take a step back and. Uh, I would take the Lions, you know, winning by, you know, 15 points, something like that. A, a fantasy note uh, for folks out there with six teams on a bye this week. Uh, if you would like to to lean hard on hoping for some Alec Pierce garbage time points, mm. I, I think this this might be a good week uh, to do that if he is available in your league. Let's go to another team in the AFC South. 
the Houston Texans at home against the Tennessee Titans, a divisional matchup. They are eight and a half point favorites, Greg, where they, they haven't really uh, had those dominant wins that came late against the Dallas Cowboys going up against Will Levis and company. The over under 42, Tom McCarthy, Jay Feely, Ross Tucker and Amanda Balionis uh, on the call. Does CJ Stroud get things going back better in the second game? Uh, with Nico Collins. Better because I like the matchup because it, I think there's some familiarity. That that could go both ways, certainly, but they, they did sweep the Titans last year. One was in overtime. It was it was close. I think through, you know, you'll be able to get some open receivers against Tennessee. That's that's how you beat them. But I, I think it's still a dangerous game for the Texans because I really doubt Joe Mixon's going to get going in this game. The tit- That's the one thing the Titans really do well. They they they, they totally shut down Minnesota last week on the ground. And so you make CJ Stroud one dimensional and I I think he's better because of the matchup, but man, I just don't think the Texans not to give away uh, our man versus machine Uh show on Friday, but man, eight and a half points. The Texans to me are just not a team that should be that favored in a division matchup over anyone. I do think the Titans have played a little better with Will Levis at quarterback the last couple of weeks hasn't totally shown up on the scoreboard. I know, but I test wise, I do think they're a better team with him at quarterback. And I think it's a little bit of a dangerous game. So I am forecasting a little of, of what you can look forward to on that show on Friday, which by the way, I mean, I'm going to just keep honking about it. Do it. The two of us are, f- are 15 and three combined over I mean, the last, last three weeks. That's pretty good. Yeah. 15. Better than, better than pretty good. I, I, I do want to, speaking of streaks mm-hmm. in terms of making picks, would you be willing to survive on the Houston Tech? Oh, I kind of forgot about Survivor. We we don't have Steve Weish, so I guess we could put an asterisk on here. I'm going to go look at the teams that we've taken okay. so far. I'm going to say no, because my vibes oh. are that the Titans keep this game close. I think it's a dangerous game. I do not want to do the Survivor. And I do see uh, our next game, I think, is one <laughs> that I feel even better about. And Eric, our producer, will check to make sure we haven't taken that. Okay. If it is closer, uh, the Texans interior offensive line giving up the third most pressures uh, in the league this season, 112. They have to deal with Jeffrey Simmons uh, coming in this week. And you mentioned Will Levis playing a little bit better. The penalties took off uh, a Calvin Ridley yes. uh, touchdown ever since Calvin Ridley went on a profanity lace tirade. Uh, more <laughs> targets going in this direction. It's good. Things have worked out. And even if plays get called back, the vibes from initially going in the end zone. Uh, yeah, that's they, good. They'll count. So, well, he seems like a vibes guy. He has 550 yards this season. Do you know that n- no one else has even half that on the Titans this season? Can you guess who their second leading receiver is? Is it NWI? It is now, yes, because <laughs> he had 98 last week. Now he's up to like 220-something. Um, is Nuke still on there? Nuke's like, yeah, he's 192. Oh it, it's gosh. it's ugly. Levis, though, surprisingly not in the top 10 in the league in turnover-worthy play percentage. It just was the interceptions that he had. He actually doesn't have that many interceptions either. He looks very mechanical to me. I don't think he's going to be it. I don't think that's controversial. Like when he's like going through his reads, you can almost hear the coaching. It's like one to two to three. And he's taking a ton of sacks the last couple of weeks, I think in an effort to not make mistakes. And I think that's positive because when he's thrown it, he's thrown it pretty well. So what I think he is going to be is an NFL quarterback that has a long career as a backup and maybe a, a frisky bridge type of guy. That That's where I see him as, but I think that's an upgrade from Mason Rudolph at least. And uh, it's a division game. I just think their offensive line gets so confused too. Like they never know who to block and it's bad. He's going to have to make the mistakes. Like y- you don't have uh, a-, a quarterback that is a Will Levis that, that <laughs> makes plays. Like you're going to have to take some risks. We don't want to see safety Will Levis. We want to see the guy that, you know, gets people fired up and, and maybe is going to, make pushes and fan bases to try to take somebody's job uh, here in a few. I have some breaking news for you. Eric has let us know uh, the Texans, the commanders and the chiefs have all been taken already this season for our survivors. So we're going to have to, we're going to go back. We're going to go back. Let's wrap the show with that. So we'll think about it in between. Yeah. We'll wrap with our, with our final pick. Um, Let's go to let's go to that NFC East game. Why not? Yeah, let's do it, Greg. It's a revenge opportunity for Dan Quinn, whose defense has had 25 sacks since week four, playing against 
Cooper Rush, who threw the ball 55 times for some reason on Monday Night Football. The Washington Commanders, a 10 and a half point favorite. Joe Davis, G Reg, and Pam Oliver on the call. Greg, we saw Dallas kind of have a similar situation where they weren't able to run the ball. I had to throw the ball a ton against Houston uh, without. Uh, Will Anderson Jr., if he was playing, which he's back, as we look back to that last game, congratulations mm. to the Texans. Good news. Him back. Um, but it, it could have been even worse, Greg. So much worse. It, it's one of the reasons why I don't really believe in the Texans that much right now. They just haven't shown it. The, the Commanders really haven't either. They they haven't been at the level, I think, of concern of, of the Texans' offense throughout the course of the season. But the numbers are the numbers. Last two weeks, under six yards per attempt for Jaden Daniels. I mean, that's far from where he was. He's taken six sacks over those two games, hadn't been taking a lot of sacks, and provided next to no rushing value. People want to make it like it's the ribs. I have a hard time with that because just speculating about injuries is difficult. And the first two games after that injury, he he played really well. So maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I just think that's irrelevant to me right now. He's just not quite as accurate the decision making hasn't been as comfortable. He's certainly not running well, but the run game overall hasn't been nearly as good in terms of Eckler and Brian Robinson consistently getting five or six yards. So I do like that they have a little extra rest here. I think that makes a difference. And I do thank the schedule gods for serving up this Cowboys team at the perfect time, because I think this, they need a get right game, Washington, and not just they let's win the game, but let's feel good about like a 28, 32 point offensive performance where we get the cliff Kingsbury falling off a cliff people off our backs and just feel better about this season. And I, I do believe they'll be able to do that. I, I didn't want to be Greg. I'm, I, I think I'm one of those cliff Kingsbury offense falling off the ledge at the end of the season. Yeah, I might be too. Uh, type people, T- Terry McLaurin, uh, s- perhaps get new Hopkins on the phone and and see how to to work this out maybe nuke has some some hindsight that he could turn into terry's foresight because he's aligned as the the left outside receiver on 75.8 percent of his snaps uh this season isolated on 26 and a half percent of those snaps we saw quinion mitchell who's over on that side all the time the they the the Washington Commanders just... With the safety, ex- too. It's yeah, not like it's just him. Just accepted yeah. that this was the matchup that we're going to give Terry. And I went... And if you if you have NFL Pro, I think you should. If you're listening to our show, go use it because you can go to the film room and look at a whole bunch of different scenarios. Terry McLaurin has been in motion five times this season, Greg. That's concerning. Five. And just thinking about this matchup, too, you know, I guess maybe it's Trayvon Diggs. I actually do think the Cowboys' defense has been more competitive it helps when you yeah, add Mike one. Yeah, Mike back, yeah. Mike goes back, but I just, overall, they've been more competitive the last couple of weeks, and they've just, they hold on and they hold on until their offense just makes it impossible and their their doors get kicked in at the very end. But I think they've been more competitive, so this to me is a stay away. I mean, I want to watch it. Stay away. Well, I just mean, like, they're, they're such big favorites and everything. I, I've been saying the Cowboys are, they're the worst team in the NFL, and I... I stand by that. They would be number 32 for me. But I just want to go watch this game, and I hope Washington's offense shows up. That's all. Well, it's the Cowboys, so you're going to have a chance to watch it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. The power of the Cowboys that they get G-Reg in this game. Give me a break. Free money. Uh, again, shout out to G-Reg, who uh, isn't isn't pouting, isn't in, just taking his opportunity. Doing the work. And, and putting in great work. Uh, good stuff on film. Uh, <laughs> you'll be back on that, that squad uh, any moment, uh, G-Reg. Let's go to... Our final game, Greg, before we make our survivor pick. It's not <laughs> eligible for a survivor pick. Uh, fun fact about this game, there's been a TikTok trend for weeks citing that the Kansas City Chiefs would fall in their first game to Bryce Young and the Carolina Panthers. It's been a fun meme. Uh, it did not happen because the Bills went ahead and took care of business. Kansas City, 10.5 point favorites at Carolina, coming off of the bye with the over-under of 43. Ian Eagle, again, shout out to the uh, my man who pointed out that I'm saying uh, Big Bird's name wrong. It, it is, in fact, Ian. I didn't know. I don't know why. I, I mm. guess it's Rappaport's fault. Uh, Charles Davis and Evan Washburn uh, on the call. Jonathan Brooks may play in this game. That's fun. Because uh, Carolina do this, Greg? Do the Chiefs lose two in a row? Can the Panthers win three in a row? I want to watch it. Yeah. Is the Bryce with Canales thing a thing? Because I, I, I've i seen it. I've seen consistency. Now you're coming off a bye against a much tougher opponent than 
perspective. Who they face so far. And that's that's what real quarterback growth is, doing it on a week to week consistent basis. And so I am intrigued to to watch that when when the Panthers have the ball. And again, this Chiefs defense doing things that we haven't seen them do. Uh, and, and all credit going to Buffalo uh, for making the plays that they did. But that was just a, a rough performance by Spag's squad on the road. And here's a, a really, a, let's be honest, an overmatched Panthers offense uh, going up against this group where. Good line yeah. coming off a bye. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not, do, it. do it. I mean, right? I'm not on TikTok. I'm too old for that. Um, I'll post some of those. They're fun. <laughs> Actually, I do think this is a, a big game for the Chiefs. Oh. Just for, for how I feel about them. Like, how does it... I said great teams respond to losses, right? They, they, they respond. They come back the next week or the next game if it's an NBA team. Just a little more. It's just mm-hmm. human nature. Like, can we get a blowout? Can we get the Chiefs, like, with a... A great offensive performance. I'm not even talking about the defense. Like, can we can we get D Hop with like eight for one twenty? Can we can can Patrick Mahomes have a good fantasy day for once? <laughs> can Xavier Worthy like not make a big time mistake just for one game? Look like the the twenty like twenty one Chiefs or the twenty nineteen Chiefs. Whatever, just do it for one game in Carolina. I don't think that's too much to ask. Do it. Do it for Greg. He needs to see these things to believe. Even even Mahomes, I thought he was really improving this season, but he really did not have a great game against the Broncos. I thought he played well enough against the Bills. I'm not going to besmirch him or anything. But I, what I'm saying is a, a wow game. Give me that because I know, obviously, they're capable of it, and exactly. we'll probably see it eventually. But just give it to me at 10 a.m. in Bank of America Stadium. That's when I want it, when it's Charles Davis. And, and not Tony Romo. That's when I want it. Yeah. Show it to us, uh, Kansas City. And now we need to show you, Greg. <laughs> we need to get all the way back, open up our first page, and try to keep the survivor streak going, E, because uh, we, we've, been on, we've been on a hot one. Okay. This is- Do we believe in Bo Nix and the Broncos enough on the road in the division? The Buccaneers, I believe, are an option. But you love Cutlets. You're, you're, I do you're the not. Tommy DeVito guy. I do not. <laughs> I'm going to run the tape back. Are the more. Dolphins available, too? I'm sure we haven't taken the Dolphins. They have the Patriots. All, okay, all three of those are available, I'm being told. Buccaneers, Dolphins. The Bucks on the road. The other two are division games. You want to go Bucks? Let's do it. No, no let's do it. You, I think that's what I feel best about, too. But you talked me into the Cutlass. I was going to take I was going to take the Broncos. Okay, should we do it? Do we believe that much? What do you guys think back there? Bo Nix. Bo Nix, thumbs up. Okay. We believe on this show, Greg. Something about it doesn't feel right. Uh oh. Oh no. We'll blame Steve for not being here. Broncos fans, if you lose this game, <laughs> all that honking that you've been doing in my mentions all season long, and then I send out like one video. That was positive. They're like, oh, Greg finally said something positive for the first time since 2015. Well, they're finally giving me something positive. Bo Nix was the first AFC Offensive Player of the Week for Denver Broncos since... Brandon Marshall? I don't know. Trevor Simeon. Trev! We were on Team Trev a million years ago, Yeah, Patrick and I, we bonded over being on Team (laughs) Trev in the newsroom in 2016. That's when it last happened. Come through for us, Broncos, in Vegas. Fun show. We'll be back on Thursday night. And like I said, yeah, we have the Anthony Weaver interviews. It's going to be part of that episode, but we will be recapping Steelers Browns. Steelers have a bad record on Thursday night. Uh Mike Tomlin on the road in the division. Like it's, it's a thing. I think it's going to be fun. Bo Wolf uh, from PHLY will be joining me. And uh, yeah, when, when we got Baldy and he's not even by the pool, you know, football is back. See you Thursday.